thanks everyone for joining us here. We have uh, the last session of today. Um, mitigating risk around non-conforming addressing scenarios. We have three non-conformists here to talk about this because it takes one and no one. So we appreciate you joining us. And I wanna introduce our presenters here. Uh, Carrie Brennan, who is the Director of Client Relations at Datamark and a, uh, an astute student of addressing. Uh, lots of good experience to share with us today. And then also Annie Cahill, who is a public safety GIS technical manager, I think is your title, with us here at, uh, at Datamark. Annie's a, a, an important doer uh, and uh, deals with these situations and projects all the time and has, has had a great career in uh, government and assigning addresses and managing them in GIS and all the rest of that. So we've got a lot of good experience to share with you today and excited to share that with you. And so I will turn it over to Carrie and Annie. Well, thank you everybody for joining in on this session today. Um, we're going to be going through uh, what is a non-conforming address scenario um, we're going to talk about defining uh, non-addressed dispatchable locations and then some mitigation methods and tools. So we're going to keep this pretty high level, um, but hopefully you will have some, uh, some good feedback for us. Um, I think Jeff did forget to mention before we started that if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the uh, questions, question and answer dialogue box. You will see that appear at the bottom of your Zoom meeting um, area. Jeff's going to be monitoring those questions. We'll answer them at the end of the session unless there's something really that we need to answer during this session. And this session is being recorded and will be made available for, uh, for all attendees after the conference is over. So let me just say all the things that Jeff was supposed to say. So let's talk a little bit about non-conforming address scenarios. Um, I'm sure that if I had you all raise your hands in the poll area, you would pretty well all say that you have some type of non-conforming addressing scenario within your jurisdiction whether that is the odd address on the even side of the road, the, um, you know, the 911 center that is in the 900 block, but its address is 911 on the even side of the road, um, halves, quarters, behinds, all sorts of different scenarios. And we're gonna talk about a lot of those. Some of them are historic that have, um, I'll say always been there since you've had addressing and how that's going to play into our migration into a next gen 911 environment where addressing and good GIS data is going to be critical when the GIS data gets loaded into the NG core services for spatial call routing. So what do you do with some of these addresses? So uh, West 239 North 6952 Menu, Sussex, Wisconsin. These are legitimate addresses. Um, 0102 Southwest Abernathy Street in Portland, Oregon. Or the 1253 Main Street behind in Fictionville, Indiana. That's the only one that's not a legitimate address, but uh, I have seen that particular style of address occur in a number of different situations. So how do you make a grid-based address like the ones you see in Wisconsin work in a public safety environment? If you look at the basics for addressing standards, the recommendation is that you don't have leading zeros in your um, house numbers or in your structure numbers, mainly because in modern um, 
computer systems, the leading zero tends to get truncated off. So if you have zero, one, zero, two, you port it into a new system, it becomes 102. You might already have a 102 Southwest Abernathy Street. You're automatically creating a duplicate address point in this case. For something like the 1256 Main Street behind, I see this a lot in um, counties where there's things like a county square and you will have storefronts on the main floor of a building and the second floor has been turned into a residential um, a residential unit an apartment and the only way that you get access to that unit is you go to the alley behind and you go up the stairs to get access but it's still the same building the same number how do you really address that. Very often you will see that um, those units have been labeled as a behind, which means that the only way that you access it is from the back of the building. So talking about some of the strategies for mitigating these risks, um, what you saw on the screen beforehand was some of the types of addresses that you may see that exist in your community that will not or may not fit into a next gen uh, environment. As well, thinking bigger picture and in a broader scope, they may not fit into your enterprise systems that you have in place. So those gridded addresses may not fit into your permitting system. They may not fit well into your computer-aided mass appraisal system. There are a couple of different options that we can throw out there that can help you to mitigate this risk. One is going through a readdressing project. That is a lengthy process if you are readdressing an entire community or an entire county, say. Potentially, it has a lot of expense associated with it. Um, things like not just the process of updating the addresses, but then the cost of all of the new signs that need to go out there, um, updating all of the systems that utilize those addresses there's a cost associated with it. And as well, it could be a political nightmare. Um, people are very attached to their addresses. They may have had them for very long, for a very long time. Changing that can cause, it can ruffle a lot of feathers. So for the most part, readdressing is, uh, I'm gonna say probably your last ditch scenario. Um, Jeff, Annie, do you have any thoughts on that? I would say if you, a total readdressing can be challenging, but it is possible. I know there are some localities who have had a really good advertising campaign um, with their citizens. And so the citizens have a solid understanding going in as to why these changes are taking place. And I feel like the more education you can provide, the better if it looks like you do have to do a readdressing. Um, in addition, sometimes you may not have a choice, especially if you're in an older area or an area where things are just so entirely messed up that, that you have to resolve those issues. Then you wanna start looking at your ordinances and making sure that your ordinances are supporting that. And we're gonna talk about that here in a few minutes. Absolutely. Your other option, um, obviously Annie just mentioned the ordinances and we're gonna talk in further detail about that. Um, you can leave it alone. Probably not the best scenario, but that is an option. Um, and then you can also mark it as a known issue and um, make sure that everybody that is utilizing your addressing data is aware that it is a known issue. So those are some of the options that you have. So strategies for mitigation, 
include um, identifying the issues within your GIS data. Very often the GIS data is where you will see all of the validation, potential validation issues. Um, you want to address your data completeness. Uh, I always, when I'm doing these presentations, tend, we tend to use addressing an issue and then addressing a structure interchangeably. So um, they do sound a little bit different, but in this case, we want to address our data completeness. Does every structure have a house number? Does every structure have a street address associated with it? Are all of the components of the street address in place? Do you have your emergency service zone? Do you have your uh, PSAP boundary information? These are all um, attributes within the GIS data that are going to be required when we move into that next gen 911 world. You know, things like ensuring you have the uh, PSAP left, PSAP right, or the parity, those are um, data attributes that we have not previously necessarily maintained in GIS, but they're going to be required and necessary when we are doing our spatial call routing. Um, governance is a big deal when it comes to strategies for mitigation. Uh, we need to have good governance to resolve these issues. So Annie is gonna be talking about ordinances a little bit later on. Um, having an addressing review committee that involves not just the addressing authority, but addressing authority, GIS, the public safety group as well, so that a consensus can be put in place. Those are all critical. Um, and then you also wanna be able to flag any non-conforming addresses, and then have your quality assurance plan in place for your data maintenance. So I like to use a, an example here when it comes to GIS mitigation um, of a community that I am aware of that has a road going through it. It is a state road on either side of the county seat, but back in the 50s or so, 60s, the street name was changed within the city boundaries to be that of a famous resident of this community. Pretty normal, that happens all the time. Obviously the state road name would become the alias for that particular, um, particular road. The issue is that when the road name changed to this famous person's name, the residences were given the option to choose if they wanted to have the state road name or that famous residence name. So it went from Mary Pickford Drive or State Road 20. So what ended up happening is you would have houses side by side. One would be addressed off of the state road, the other would be addressed off of um, the Mary Pickford way, and it just caused a lot of confusion. All of those anomalies were flagged, and this is where, you know, it's an intermingled web. Governance comes into play as well. So what this community has done is they have taken the, um, I'll say the wait and see approach, in that uh, the residences along this road are eventually going to be transferring their title to somebody else. They're gonna be selling the property, um, things like that. A good ordinance that they have in place basically states that when the title changes from the current resident to a new resident, that new resident has to adopt the official road name. So it's going to take a little bit of time, but they've flagged these non-conforming addresses and they have a mitigation process in place to resolve this issue. Um, other mitigation measures, Absolutely, this falls under the education umbrella. Stakeholder education, we need to educate our 
city, county officials, all of the department heads that are potentially going to be consuming this data. We also need to educate our developers and anybody that might have a stake in addressing. So your local utilities also have a stake in addressing. Very often in a rural community, a barn will need to have an address associated with it that may not be the same as the primary structure of a farm. The reason why is because there's a utility pole that's there that the billing has to go to basically the farm or the farm corporation versus the house that has the, um, the residence on it public education as well and Annie spoke to this a moment ago it is absolutely critical that we do public education to ensure that the residents of our communities if there are going to be changes to addressing or why you need to post your 911 address sign that we have all of those um, education moments available it's also very important that we don't do a, um, I'll say a one and done educational process. You have to do multiple different ways of communicating with the public and stakeholders for that matter on the importance of good addressing. So having community sessions, town halls at the local community centers or the libraries um, is going to be critical and you might have to have them once a month for six months to ensure that everybody has access to it. Articles in the local newspapers, lunch and learns at the courthouse to ensure that everybody that is involved in addressing or has a stake in it understands what's going on. And then another really important thing is to have really good communication feedback loops. So if we look at the grand scheme of things, we have uh, frontline telecommunicators that are utilizing our GIS data and our addressing data every day when they are answering calls. If they find an issue, what is the mechanism for them to report that back to the addressing and GIS officials so that the issue can be resolved? And what is the process in place to ensure that those frontline telecommunicators know that that information, that potentially bad address has been resolved? We need to have that full communication loop in this case. Um, creating of ordinances. This is where Annie is going to jump in and talk a little bit. Thanks, Carrie. Um, can you hear me okay, Carrie? Yes, perfectly fine. Okay, great. So um, I guess I'll just kind of start off with some personal experience. I've been involved um, with many localities and a lot of times when you when you start talking to people about the ordinance process, we, we really kind of address this during our strategic planning. Um, phase, we, we always uh, like to know what people have in place prior to uh, writing a strategic plan. Um, many people don't know if they have an ordinance, and if they do have an ordinance, a lot of times it's outdated or they haven't looked at it in a while, they can't really say what's in it, or it's very loosely written. Um, and an ordinance is, is one, of, one of the most important things that you can have as a locality to support your addressing authority and all that that implies. Um, it's really important to establish the address authority in an ordinance. That tells you up front, hey, here's the responsible designated agent who's, who's going to take care of all of the addressing, the road center lines, collecting fees if, 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 uh, if so deemed by the authority. A lot of, a lot of localities uh, will actually charge for addressing. But and the main thing is, is that if, if you look at it from a GIS perspective, because that's, that's my background is GIS, a lot of times you will have when working with public safety, you'll come in contact with, with people who say, look, you know, we've had an issue um, where we have a persistent 
problem child structure. So we, we persistently get calls from, from a structure that we can't find, either because the person hasn't chosen to post their number or they're posting an incorrect number or any number of reasons. Their number might be out of order. Um, and, and a lot of times, if it's an issue within the GIS data, it can be easily rectified. But sometimes you actually will have to pursue getting that corrected in the real world. And sometimes if you don't have an addressing ordinance, which states your authority, that can be very difficult because you're really relying on the cooperation of the homeowner. And we've talked to, I personally have talked to many localities and they've said, look, you know, we've tried to work with, you know, Mr. Smith for a year and he's just, he's, he's not complying. And, you know, he had a structure on fire on his property and we couldn't find it at night because he sat, you know, a hundred feet off the road and wanted to know why we couldn't find him at night when it was a rural property. Um, so you come into contact with stuff like this all the time. And, and the first thing that I always tell people is go back to your ordinance, understand what's in it, understand what it says. Who does it designate as the agency for assigning addresses? What does it say about enforcement? When you have a dispatcher or someone in public safety who comes to you and says, hey, look, you know, we have a structure in violation. He's supposed to be 120 and he's actually um, 123 we really need you to get this fixed because it's causing problems with response. So you need to make sure that your ordinance very thoroughly dictates that violation process. What does that look like? Yes, there is a cost incurred with changing your address, okay? But in your ordinance, you can state, we will give you X number of months, weeks, or a year, or however longer to get your address fixed. But if you don't have it fixed by the state, um, here are the penalties and you could possibly be taken to court. And back in my local government days, we actually did go to court on a couple of occasions for people who flat out refused to change their address. And to be honest, when you bring decorated public safety people into a courtroom, the judge doesn't get very happy. He, he gets really upset about it and says, just change your address. Like, just do the right thing and change it. Um, so, so the ordinance is really your backbone. It's your teeth when you need to get certain things corrected because otherwise you're going to be dealing with persistent anomalies. An ordinance also should really describe your whole procedure for addressing. If you have a grid-based system, if you have a, a, um, a distance-based numbering system, it really should detail that. And it also should detail um, what, are the, what are the procedures that need to be followed when you're applying for an address or when you need a change of address. It also should dictate about your road naming rules and regulations. What happens when someone needs a road name? Um, how do you know if someone needs a road name? Is it when three or more structures share a right of way? Is that when it's time to give it a road name? Um, at what part of the development process would someone need to name a road? You need to outline all of that in your ordinance. Um, also, what happens if someone wants to change a road name? Um, there should be a process involved in that, and that should also be detailed. Again, the fees. What if you charge for an address? What are the process for paying those fees? And then finally, an ordinance also should, um, it should really address how you post the numbers. I know it seems like not really, you know, it's kind of an afterthought for a lot of people, but really that's, that's the big deal, right? Is, is making sure that our emergency responders can actually see the address when they go to respond to the emergency. Um, you, you want a situation where they can pull up to a house and know um, hey, this is 123 Main Street. So, so you want to make sure that you have very clear guidelines for posting and for street signage because that's also really important. Hey, Annie, we've got a couple of yeah. good questions and I think this might be a good time to address them. Uh, Lisa asks, what department in a city and a county uh, would have the ordinance information? Well, in my experience, a lot of times, um, that ordinance information would originate within the planning department. I know historically addressing within local government has often fallen within planning because back in the day, um, like in the 80s, GIS wasn't really a thing. So you didn't really see the addressing authority lying with the GIS department because it simply didn't exist. So a lot of times it's planning, it could be public works. Um, if you have a, a county attorney, um, someone on retainer, you could also check with that person as well. And obviously your administration would, would probably have some really good resources too. 
And is Annie, it, I've, I've seen uh, where it is the county engineer's office or mm -hmm. even the county surveyor's yeah. office. And it's not a rare occasion right. that it doesn't sit in a public safety department as well. Correct. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, the next one, Tom says, speaking of ordinances, do you happen to have any template language for the enforcement? Um, you know what? A lot of times you can actually find ordinances online. Um, and I can I can do some digging and see. I, I think a lot of localities use Muni code, so you can kind of dig through there and and see what you can find in different localities. But I I'm happy to do some research and send you some some examples. Yeah, I'd say Tom. Uh, at the end of this um, presentation, Annie's email address will show up on the screen. I'd uh, highly recommend that you just take that down, send her a quick email, and you guys can uh, can chat about that. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, also kind of a comment came in. Um, Rhonda says, quite unfortunately, most city and county code enforcements are lacking and really do not have much push, uh, even when ordinance spells it out. I don't know well, if there's a reaction to that. <laughs> well, my, and I, and I don't disagree with you, okay? The, the real issue is, um, yes, you can have the most solid, most thorough ordinance. If you're not willing to enforce it, that's a problem. Um, it, the, the big shift here, especially, especially when we're talking about um, next gen and addressing, addressing is for public safety. And it's really, it's really to the citizens benefit to make sure that they have the appropriate address posted appropriately and within the guidelines and so yes you have to be willing to pursue you have to be willing to to be the bad guy for public safety i mean i i went into court on a couple of occasions because people simply did not did not want to do what they were supposed to do and like i said the judge was not happy he thought it was really stupid that you know people had let it get to that point and and you know what i'm saying is is that generally the courts will always back public safety because you know we're here for the citizens and and that's i think that's really important yeah and one Getting of my that, again, lives, goes, i worked for a, a 901 network and we weren't the addressing authority we weren't the city we weren't the county we we're just the 901 network but just having us come to present it at a council meeting or a community meeting gave weight and gravitas to that that you know sometimes it mattered sometimes it didn't but you know, there's a lot of things that uh, that can go into those persuasive arguments that have to take place. Okay, then there's a couple more comments about that. Robert uh, says he'd be happy to share uh, some language that he has. So Robert, I'd encourage you maybe send that to Annie and as uh, Tom or whomever it was uh, emails her, she can share that back out as well. And yeah, thank you guys. We've 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 obviously hit a uh, uh, a good topic here because there's lots of uh, comments coming in. I think we're gonna try to find a way to kind of get those maybe some notes or something put out there for everybody, along with the recordings when we distribute them. So be looking for that. So um, Emma just brings up a good question or a good comment. Are there any state guidelines? Uh, that would need to be followed for an addressing ordinance? And can a local government create an ordinance uh, to fit their needs? So the, um, the short answer, Emma, is local governments can assign their own or create their own ordinances to fit their needs, but we also need to look at it from a greater standpoint of ensuring that it fits into the needs of um, public safety, as Annie was saying, but also the full enterprise of how a local jurisdiction does business. Um, state guidelines, I've not seen any. Annie, have you? Jeff? No, I'm not, I'm not I would just... Ready. I haven't, but I would just say that a lot of states, um, a lot of states already have overarching guidance for next gen in general, and just make sure that whatever you're doing is supporting 
whatever the state has going on. Um, but generally, you'll find that with ordinances and things like that, it's, it's, it's left up to the locality. Yeah. That's my experience as well. <clears throat> All right. Uh, just another comment here, and then I think it'll be a good time to move on. Uh, Diane says, problem is addressing will not fix addressing issues. <laughs> that's, that's ironic. Uh, they say, prove that it's an issue since the vehicle has map data in the emergency vehicle. So, you know, there's a lot of different perspectives on things and, you know, sometimes you, you can't fix a stubborn person. So, <laughs> do the best you there's can. There's no ordinances for that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And I don't think there's anybody that has worked in addressing GIS public safety that hasn't run yeah. into that person at some point. Yeah, points in my career, I've had a bruise right here on my forehead for just that reason. <laughs> um, so just talking a little bit more about the addressing process and the stakeholders that are involved in it. Um, so we have four different uh, circles on the screen of this awesome Venn diagram, because I'm a big fan of Venn diagrams, we've got the requester, the person that is asking for a new address. That could be a developer, it could be um, an individual uh, homeowner that is building a new structure in a rural environment. Um, the requester is going to be different in different cases. The addressing authority and the addressing authority is the department, the group that is responsible for assigning the addresses. And it's very important to understand that the addressing authority is taking into consideration public safety, but they have a lot of different hats that they wear. And it is often very much a political environment that they are working in. I don't want my address to be a negative, or not a negative number, excuse me, nobody wants a negative numbered address. Um, I don't want my number to be, you know, 252. I want it to be 254 because that's my lucky number. And they've got to kind of tread lightly through that, um, I'll call it a political minefield. Um, they are also potentially assigning addresses that are not being applied to a, um, a traditional structure that we would think of. So a lot of communities will assign addresses to things like utilities, um, anything that has power running to it. Maybe it's the public works department that needs to have an address associated with valves in the ground. You might need an address to a gatehouse going into a gated community. Those are all things that the addressing authority needs to take into consideration. The GIS people are going to um, graphically represent what the addressing authority has put in place and they're going to make sure that in the grand scheme of things, all of the components are falling into the right order. So 123 Main Street falls on the uh, 100 block of the road. It's not on the 1000 block of the road. The GIS people have the ability to go in and um, do that analysis and help to locate any of those potential anomalies. And then the 911 authority, especially when we're talking in terms of the next gen 911 world, um, the 911 authority typically is going to be the group that is responsible for ensuring that the data that is loaded into the NG core services is at a level that it needs to be for spatial call routing. Now, the 911 authority might be the PSAP. It could actually be GIS or addressing. That really depends on the makeup of your community. Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about the non addressed dispatchable locations? Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
So non-address dispatchable location is, you know, something that can, should, should be used for public safety purposes. I'll say it that way. Um, you see the Nina Master Glossary of Terms definition for that, for a dispatchable location. What, what uh, particularly 911 GIS professionals or GIS professionals are supporting 911 need to realize is that there is a way in the next gen schema, uh, the, the schema was built to be flexible, to handle locations that need to be a dispatchable location, but perhaps don't have a main address for them. Those sub address fields that are in there that go flow into the PIDA flow uh, as part of a, the kind of makes a location dispatchable um, are there to support this kind of a thing. It's the, the statue of the city's founder that everybody knows, but they don't know exactly the address of, kind of akin to the idea of what you might think of as a common place name uh, or a premise location in a CAD system that isn't used elsewhere. So as you prepare address points for NextGen 911, you could utilize this concept to handle some of those kind of notable structures uh, or even areas, they don't have to be a structure, but areas such as, you know, um, quads at a college or wings of a building of a hospital, for instance, or uh, notable locations throughout your area that callers may know where they're at, but not know the address of, and that uh, can be, that responders can be dispatched to. My favorite example of that, Jeff, is um, what is the 911 address of the U.S. Capitol building? Do tell. It doesn't have one. It's, it's not such a thing. Huh? No, it, it is not, you know, 9000 Constitution Avenue or, um, no. you know, whatever it is. It does not have a... 911 address, but that certainly is a dispatchable location that you need to be able to take into consideration. Right. Now, if you have those types of structures in or areas in your community, um, one of the things that Nina is working on, and they've already published out um, a standard on this or a uh, informational paper, it's called CLDXF, the Civic Location Data Exchange Format, which is a way to take structure information and translate it so that it can be utilized in the PIDA flow. And that is going to be a key component for you being able to translate data from say your address information into things like your common places or landmark information. And those will support, obviously, your CAD systems and other uh, public safety systems. Right. So mitigating risks. Um, planning is a key component of it. Um, if you haven't already figured that out from what we were discussing, uh, are you going to have a um, an addressing system that is parcel based or is it a structure based addressing system? Are you using actual ranges versus theoretical ranges? I do know that there are certain CAD systems that like to use theoretical ranges um, and don't always do well with the actual ranges, whereas in the next gen core services, actual ranges are what is recommended. Um, Planning out with your addressing authority or authorities, if you are a GIS department that has multiple addressing authorities that are all rolling data up into your system, it's really important to get everybody at the table, everybody communicating on the same page. Um, there are obviously technology tools that can help with that as well. And then embrace a strategy. Make sure that you have a good strategy in place for when you find these anomalous issues, for when you are adding in new addresses, new um, 
you know, new communities are going into place, uh, you know, a new subdivision, even though the community name might be different, you can't have every an entire subdivision named Steeplechase, Steeplechase Drive, Steeplechase Way, never a good idea. Data quality is another key component. Um, do you have information available? Do you have data available to start bringing into your system? Most people, thankfully, have already at least a baseline data set in place. As we're migrating over to a next-gen environment, do you have all of the necessary data present? Do you have a PSAP boundary file created? Have you communicated with your neighbors so that you don't have gaps and overlaps? Um, do you have a provisioning boundary and all of your emergency service boundaries defined out? Do you have completeness of your data? So do you have address points that are missing house numbers or missing street names or again, parody, things like that? Does your data reflect the real world? Is it actually accurate? Do your address points align up generally with the structures that could be seen from your aerial photography? And how timely is it? I was teaching a class about a year ago and talking with some addressing uh, GIS folks and they were a county and they were receiving GIS data from some of the communities within their, um, within their jurisdiction. Literally, they were getting updated data once every four to five years. And that's completely unacceptable. Now, if they're sending information over in a tabular format that can be translated into GIS, that's fine. But to just have that void, the timeliness is not there. And then is your data consistent between systems? Do you have duplicates? Uh, anybody else want to jump in on any of that? Nope. Okay, going on. <laughs> so data quality, one of the best ways to figure out if your data quality is what it needs to be is to use something uh, known as a fishbone analysis. Fishbone analysis is a process where your address points are compared to your road center lines. And essentially, the address points are geocoded to the address range. So it compares the place address point to the geocoded location. As you can see, with 180 and 175 Main Street, uh, 180 is out of uh, order with 175. And when those fish bones or the ribs cross, that's going to signify a potential anomaly, a potential issue. Now, just because they are out of order doesn't necessarily mean that they are incorrect. So you have to jump in and do investigating and figure out why it is that way, if it should stay that way, or if changes need to be made. Now, if it's going to stay that way, you may need to mark it as an exception to the rules and move on. Again, you may need to have ordinances in place that are going to um, enable you to resolve these issues if it truly is an issue. It could also be that in the real world, we go from 150 to 175 to 180, but in our GIS data, there was you know, somebody fat fingered a key and keyed in the address points incorrectly. So those are the types of things that you want to be able to look at. Uh, these are just some more examples of data quality. You will note that in this particular environment, we've got a very densely populated area. Every single one of those ribs of the fishbone are aligning nicely with the road center line, with the exception of the little red X at the bottom where 
the two um, structure numbers are reversed in comparison to what the road range is. There's just a highlight of it. Now in this example, um, we've got some good looking ribs of our fishbone, but what we are seeing here is that the road range on that particular segment is really kind of weighted to the south part of that road. Um, so in this case, it could be that the range on that road segment is too large for what we have. And we may need to kind of alter that, change it up because there's not going to be any additional structures built into that particular road. Address point duplication. Um, you should not have duplicate address points um, when, there are, when there is sub address information um, added into your data set. If you have sub address, so your unit field or floor building seat in, um, in your GIS data all filled out, you shouldn't have two 112 Gephardt roads. Uh, this particular example, because it is a rural area, earlier on I was talking about when a utility might have an address associated with a barn because they've got utility poles or lights that they address. This is where potentially this um, anomaly could have snuck in. So they probably should not both be 112 Gephardt Road You've identified it, now you can do your sleuthing, figure out what the issue is, and resolve it. And Annie, can I have you speak for a moment? Because I'm going to yes, take a drink of water. And actually, we have some questions, so I can go ahead and address those. Um, Catherine says, I'm interested in someone speaking about consistency with multi-level structures that is intuitive. Would a responder know that the address is on the second or third floor as soon as they received the address? So Jeff, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I mean, I, that just depends on how you, how you do your sub addressing. Um, and it's a good question. It's one of those things that probably should either be part of an addressing ordinance to say that you want addresses, sub addresses to indicate the floor that it's on or that you prefer an A or a B versus uh, 101 or 103, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> and I would I would say that that is a that would be a, a smart part of an ordinance to include, um, and is is a good practice to utilize. Yeah, and then the second question is from Rachel um, about duplicate addresses. There. There may be real life instances where two buildings have the same address or two parcels have the same address. For example, a ranch with a house in a large barn or a rural property that runs across several parcels. Any concerns about that type of situation? Yes, a lot of concerns. Um, we definitely want to see individual structures with individual addresses. Okay, so if you have the space available, um, if you had a parcel and then like an in-law or a, a parcel with the parent structure with um, maybe like an in-law suite or a barn. Um, we know that a lot of barns, uh, because they require electricity, uh, many of them will need an address. So we would always, I would always personally recommend that someone give that barn a second address um, that's separate from the main house. Now, if uh, you have a situation, did you want to say something, Carrie? Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, but if you have a situation where that cannot happen, in looking at like the NG911 data model, they actually have a building field. So you can name it like building one, building two. And I think I just jumped over no. what you were going to say. Give it a yeah, no, that's okay. I, I you know, if, if you if you have the available addressing and it's and it's two separate structures, then yes, go ahead and give two separate addresses. But But if they're attached or if you have a home that you're dividing up into two living spaces or something, then yes, definitely uh, leverage that sub addressing. That's also helpful. I think the other part of this, when you talk about parcels having duplicate addresses, um, this is one good place where you can demonstrate the difference between a situs address that you would find on a parcel 
and a site or structure address that is really necessary for public safety needs. Because you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want that duplicate address to be in your public safety data set, but it's perfectly fine if the situs address of two parcels is the same because the envelope gets to the right place so that the bill is in place and paid. Right. Correct. Yeah, and, and just kind of a side note, and I know that Jeff, you and I talked about this on Monday a little bit, addressing for planning purposes is, is often a very different business need than for public safety because planning is very concerned about um, a parcel address, but um, public safety tends to be more granular, you need more detail, um, and every structure really should, should have an address. So um, we have about 10 minutes and a couple more questions. What I'm gonna do, Carrie, is recommend that we uh, get through these quality checks here really quick and then get to these couple of questions because I think there's some, some useful ones here. So we didn't warn everybody at the beginning that between the three of us, we are all talkers. And <laughs> Thomas, I see that you've raised your hand. If you've got a question, if you can just type it in the Q&A section, um, there should be a dialog box at the bottom of your screen. So, um, so some of the other quality control checks that we wanna look at are address points that are not reflected in the road center line. So you've got an address point out there um, it's a mismatched street name field in both address point and the road center line potentially. Um, streets are misspelled. And when we get into it, this can be really granular. Um, you know, inconsistent directionality in the address points, you don't have direction, but in um, your road center lines, you do. That will cause mismatch, inconsistent street types, missing roads, even just spelling. Um, is, is a key thing here. <clears throat> um, misordered along the road center line, we have talked a fair bit about this where um, you have to determine if the address is actually reflected in the GIS and sometimes the address is bad. The only way to fix it is to go in and change it. In this particular case, the examples that we have here, you've got a couple of different units um, in like say strip mall, the way that they fall in to place, uh, they may not actually match directly with what the road center line is. May not be an error in this case or an anomaly, you would mark that as an exception. If you need to though, you do have to consider going in and fixing those. Uh, digitized direction is an important thing. In most cases, the direction of digital digitization was not um, an important factor when the GIS data was created. So uh, with Indian Peak Drive here, we've got um, the 8200 to 8499 is <clears throat> increasing um, to, the, to the right, but the direction of DIG is going in the opposite direction or excuse me, that's the opposite. It's the 5100 that is going in the wrong direction. Um, so you'd wanna flip that, make sure that the left and rights are retained the way that they need to be and resolve that issue. This also is a critical component when you are using your GIS data for doing routing. And then it's really important that we look <clears throat> at our address data in relationship holistically with all of the components of the of the 911 system. So we currently still use the MSAG and Alley. So if you have an MSAG record that has no matching road center line, um, why? It's important to consider the legacy 911 databases. It's also um, important to understand that sometimes MSAGs were altered and changed to make things work. Um, but as we progress and get our data quality much higher, we need to go in and fix either the MSAG or the GIS data or both to ensure that they are properly aligning. And then 
let's talk about what public safety can do. Because we've talked a lot about um, GIS and addressing public safety. Uh, our public safety telecommunicators, our 911 directors, uh, center managers, all pay, play a critical part in this whole process. <clears throat> so it's really important that we educate. You'll notice that educate is a theme throughout the entire um, session. Educating our telecommunicators on the language of GIS. So when you talk to a frontline telecommunicator, they may just say, oh, well, the map is broken or the map is not working. It's important for them to understand address points, road center lines, boundaries, um, and do some education there. Equally, it is important that GIS professionals uh, spend some time in the 911 center, shadow a telecommunicator for a half a day. I wouldn't recommend right now during, um, during this pretty stressful time for everybody, but spend some time in a 911 center, get to understand how our telecommunicators use GIS, how they use the addressing that we are working on. <clears throat> and it helps for cross communication to understand the importance of uniform um, addressing across all applications. Equally as important is it is critical to have in place a mechanism to communicate to GIS and addressing from the telecommunicators that there is an issue and then have that communication loop go back so that the telecommunicators understand that the problem is being fixed or being addressed. We hear stories about a telecommunicator says, oh yeah, I saw the GIS person. I handed a sticky note to them in the hallway about this, um, <clears throat> this address anomaly and I've never heard back from them. So closing that loop is going to be absolutely critical for um, ensuring that the data quality is high and then ensuring that the confidence level in GIS is where we need it to be. And with that, are there any other questions? Because I see that we are yeah. just a few yeah, minutes have, from the top of the hour. Three questions and three minutes. So this is a challenge for talkers like us. <laughs> Brian asks, if there's a problem with addresses, addresses 175 being on the wrong place from where address house number 180 being in the wrong order, but must remain, like you mentioned, Carrie, I, I think in the uh, fishbone example, yep. um, you said mark it as an exception. Would the GIS person follow standards and break the roads and attribute the, the from to address range values to match the location of where the addresses are out of order, not just mark the problem as an exception? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's a necessary thing to do at all. In fact, you would uh, really mess up a geolocator if you did that, or well, maybe not messed up, but you would, you would inter, introduce unnecessary points of failure, I'll say it that way, um, if you were to do that. Now, <clears throat> if you had to, uh, there's probably a, a lot of some, some reasons why your data could be perfect if you did that, but I don't think it's necessary to do it every time. What do you guys think? It, it also adds a level of um, <clears throat> maintenance that would be very, very challenging to maintain. Yep. And if Brian leaves, does the next person True. know uh, all of those nuances? So True. what happens if Brian hits the lottery? Then we're all in trouble. Exactly. All right, good. Uh, Lisa says, so in our city, in our city, we have a multitude of addresses that are 305 San Francisco and 305 a half San Francisco. What is the way these type, these type situations are dealt with? There was another question asked, and I typed an answer to it that's, that asked, how uh, will the NG91 schema be able to handle alpha characters in the street and the address number? And I think it's the same question and answer here, is that the CLDXF 
uh, informs the GIS data model to parse address numbers into three fields in this case, a address number prefix, an address number, and an address number suffix. So that suffix field would contain your half, uh, if in fact the half is part of the address number and not a unit number. So this is why I hate fractionals and addressing because they are ambiguous at best. And so sort of like in, in the perfect world, I would just take away the half and make it a, a sub address uh, unit number. Um, but if it is part of the address, then it would go in that address number suffix. And then uh, Vicky asks, says, so how, how do you handle assigning addresses to all structures when your local zone, zoning ordinance allows secondary structures with a primary structure? but the secondary structure is not permitted to be a use by itself. As in the case of a ranch with a house, the primary use and a barn, which is considered secondary and cannot be occupied or receive mail delivery. Anyway. So again, I think that's possibly where you would have the, um, the same address, 123 Main Street, but you could have building one, building two or the secondary would be barn in this particular case. Yeah, unit A, unit B, right. Yeah. You could treat it yeah. the same as a, as a granny flat in a more urban setting as well, or a, a house that was built over, or an apartment that's built over the garage that needs to be a secondary dwelling unit. That should really just be a unit number. Yeah. And for every, um, for every comment that we are making here, there will probably be an exception along the way. Yeah, um, addressing is a uh, as much an art as it is a science. A fluid and, situation, right? Yeah, it's a very fluid situation. There are basic um, tenets that we follow when it comes to addressing, uh, but it is, as Jeff said, a very fluid situation. All right, great. Uh, there's one last question come in and then we're gonna wrap it up here. Can you make up your own secondary address designators like one, two, three, Main Street? Well, I guess if you're the addressing authority, you could do that. Or if you're the USPS and the only thing you're concerned about is getting the envelope to the right box. Um, but outside of those, I would advise against that. Uh, Annie or Carrie, any thoughts on that? I would say if you're going to do that, make sure you've got it in your ordinance. Mm -hmm. Any? Um, I would just, I would try to stick with the standards um, as far as, you know, whether calling it unit or building, building is, is perfectly appropriate, but you can definitely do your own thing if that's what you wanted to do. And just, Kind of as a, a last comment, there are some great resources out there. Um, <clears throat> there's, you know, there have been books written on um, addressing for <clears throat> for 911, um, the FGDC standard uh, for um, site structure locations is also a good thing to reference. Um, the U.S. Postal Service Pub 28. It's kind of like a pyramid where as we get down to the next gen 911 data model, they're all, um, I'll say derivatives of kind of FGDC at the top. Um, and, you know, FGDC was built with every type of addressing in mind. The information that is being pulled out for next gen 911 is really meant for for call, um, spatial call routing and using in a public safety environment. But there's a lot of great information that you can get, again, from FGDC, from NINA, um, the US Postal Service, that would help you with this. Great, all right. Well, thank you for the questions and the interaction. We love, uh, we love that part of this uh, experience. We hope this has been a useful uh, session for you. Thanks for your attendance. Uh, everybody have a great day. And we have one more day Thank tomorrow you. of our virtual public safety conference. We encourage you to, to log in tomorrow, register and log in tomorrow and, and hear from 
uh, a lot of great speakers about a lot of great topics as we wrap up. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you.